Hello, welcome back to the course, Privacy and Security in Online Social Media, uh, Week 12, uh, Part 2. Uh, it's actually amazing how uh, to see 12 weeks have passed uh, and uh, we've been able to generate some uh, interesting content for this course and many of the content uh, that we generated are also new for this course, which I hope you liked. And uh, today, what uh, this lecture, what we will do is actually to uh, summarize what all we have seen as part of this course. Uh, and when I was putting the lecture together, I was, I was really thinking that, wow, we have really covered a lot of topics in this course. So I hope uh, uh, you are also able to understand, appreciate uh, the, the post conditions that we had set up in the first week of the class for what we'll cover as part of this course. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, please put it on this course. Uh, and it was also fun to meet uh, some of you in person um, as part of uh, you taking this class. Uh, we hope that uh, you will spread the word about the course and we'll have more students taking this course in the future. Uh, and you can also help us as part of this course in the future too. Right? Uh, so let's continue. Uh, any questions, feel free to drop a message. Uh, so this is the first uh, flyer that I had made uh, as part of this course. I don't know whether how many of you have seen it, uh, but I, I, I like doing some of these things. So I ended up uh, creating this uh, uh, flyer and posting it on social, saying that I'm, I'm teaching this course uh, for uh, students uh, taking the BS program and uh, duration, physical meetup, email address. So this is like a, a template I have and I, and I also like doing some of these things. Uh, so we ended up actually uh, doing uh, this flyer and posting it on social. Of course, uh, today many, many of you are connected uh, to me on social. Uh, probably you will help spread these content uh, in future uh, when you see it on your social media. And of course, uh, one of the one of the main intent or interest for me also is to uh, spread some of these ideas, uh, concepts, uh, interesting uh, things that we can do with the data that is publicly available to more and more people. Uh, so this is almost like a copy paste of slides from the week of the content that we had seen and I will talk about some of it uh, as and when uh, appropriate. So this is the week one and uh, if you see uh, this is the slide I said that the course is designed around these four lines and uh, the lines are and let's look at it now, right? Let's look at it now and see whether we have actually covered uh, enough parts of these post conditions and we actually satisfy some of the things and we understand some of the ideas presented in this post conditions and we are happy about doing it also. List various privacy and security concerns, spam, phishing, fraud nodes, identity theft on online social networks. I'm, I'm guessing you would you would be able to list down, list down, discuss, um, interpret, criticize the discussion around the topics of security and privacy on social media. Of course, uh, it can be more and more in depth. Of course, if you start reading papers, of course, you start working on this topic, you're going to have a lot more questions to answer than finding answers themselves. describe uh, different methodologies used for solving security and privacy problems on, on online social networks, right? Uh, so different methodologies. The first one is more listing various ideas. Second one is describing methods to solve the problem. 
So this one is uh, again, if you have, if you remember the content, uh, we have addressed many many methodologies which can help addressing the problem: spam problem, phishing problem, uh, fraud nodes problem, identity theft, uh, identity resolution. Right? So many methods that we saw as part of this course. And of late week 11 and week 12, the first part we also saw some papers in depth methods like BERT, how does it work, right? Uh, uh, then we saw regression, um, how well it can be actually used, RDD, right? So how in this, in this uh, paper about uh, um, Snapchat, in this paper about popularity shock, we, we looked at some of the methods in detail and uh, again in week 12, part one, we saw how um, researchers have done ways by which they were actually able to study the bias in which the data we collect from Twitter is. And they were also able to manipulate the content that is actually provided in the, um, from the Twitter. Uh, student will be able to collect uh, data uh, from OSM, analyze and visualize the data within the context of privacy and security in online social media. Student will be able to collect data, uh, analyze and visualize. Right? So this is the second, the third outcome that we had as part of this course. I'm sure by now, and some of you have already discussed with me also in the live sessions, where you are already collecting data, analyzing data to see the patterns and everything. That's that's exactly what we would like students taking this class to. Last one we kept it as optional. Uh, design a project idea to attack uh, online uh, one problem discussed in the course or any topic you identify in the online social networks, which was optional. Um, given the structure of this course, given the way that the time constraints that we have as part of this course, given the many courses that you're taking and you're doing other things also as part of your daily life, uh, the projects are harder to do uh, in this mode. We'll see how we can actually get some of you get involved uh, in projects. In week one, we also tell detailed list of topics that uh, we were going to cover, uh, which is social network analysis 101, uh, different types, uh, what we use it for, influencers, uh, measures, metrics, centrality, problems, challenges in collecting data, uh, collecting data from social media, API, rate limits, Twitter data, Reddit data, other platforms, what is possible and what is not possible, uh, text analysis of social media data, In the week two and week three we also did hands-on data collection. Uh, so I'm sure you were able to get data from uh, the social platforms and play it around yourself also. Uh, text analysis of social media data, uh, post comments, replies, differences across different networks. Uh, of course, the signal to noise ratio we talked about, noise, spelling, code mixing, uh, pre-processing of the data. Uh, topic discovery, LDA, how do you get clustering, how, how do you get topics from the tweets that you have, uh, entity extraction, topic modeling. Week four and five, we spent a lot more time on cybercrime, uh, on social media, policing, hate, bully, trolling, methods to detect uh, these. And we also saw some ways to, by which we can actually try and address this problem. Uh, f uh, week six and seven, we saw fake news. Uh, fake news is such a huge topic, and everybody we talk about uh, say that it's a it's a big problem to solve. There are also uh, questions about is it even a problem, right? Fake news. Uh, everybody knows that it's a problem, and everybody is falling for these kind of fake news. Is deduction predicting whether the post is uh, fake or not? Will that solve the problem? We need real world interventions to build to solve the problem. Uh, how does it spread different forms, manipulated, misleading, false content, fact checking, 
uh, detection, propagation, intervention, practical solutions to build. Uh, so this part we also saw uh, real technologies that were built, uh, methods to actually detect um, fake news. Week 8 and 9 we spent a lot of time in just looking at the problem of privacy specifically. Uh, tracking of social footprints, identities, identity resolution, disclosure of privacy, uh, usable privacy settings, uh, privacy policies, information disclosure, uh, collateral damage, which is how we can actually put together the garment information, your um, the information that's publicly available and information that is available on Twitter or Insta. How do you put them together and create some profiles of users? shadow profiles, personally identifiable information. Uh, week 10, we did ethics, bias in social media, emotional uh, contagion, uh, studies on um, uh, concern, informed concern, biases in social media, and inferences from bias data. So we also saw the uh, Twitter uh, study where bias uh, from the Twitter sampling itself could be there. We also have the Facebook study, OkCupid study, all of that where there are um, uh, ethical questions that needs to be also asked. Uh, week 11, we, uh, we changed into uh, week 11 and week 12, part 1. We shifted to looking at papers uh, which had actually taken some of the methods from before. We looked at BERT, we looked at uh, regression, we looked at content that is more specific to how uh, problems can be solved and methods that can be actually used. Uh, Sai, I'm going to take a little bit video. Dekh so that was the list of topics that we said we'll actually cover. We have done fairly very well in terms of creating content, in terms of delivering content for you in these topics. Hopefully you also picked a lot of um, useful methods and useful uh, skills as part of the content of this course. Large list of social media that we saw. And uh, over the period of the semester also, we saw that things going, changing in different platforms. For example, Twitter has been going through uh, changes as we speak and as we've been speaking for the last 12 weeks also uh, in terms of the data that is available for API, in terms of uh, the verification, the verification uh, status, uh, blue tick, low tick, gray tick, all of this is going on. We talked about platforms like Blind, um, a Parler, uh, Mastodon. These are platforms that are getting, these are platforms that get like spikes of users when something else happening in different platforms. Like Twitter was having a lot of issues about uh, Elon Musk's um, uh, takeover and people wanted a more distributed platform. People wanted probably a different platform to try out. A lot of people went to uh, Mastodon. Uh, similarly, for when the capital rights were happening, there was a lot of uh, usage of Parler. Uh, there was Gab also we discussed in class, which, uh, which was popular at some point in time. But still, the, all these platforms have large number of users as we speak in the course also. Social media has become such an important platform, important tool for a lot of activities in the society today. I'm, I'm sure you have friends, you yourself, talk about what you're doing daily, uh, what are, are interested in knowing what others are doing, interested in knowing what you're um, favorite cricketer is doing, favorite uh, uh, musician is doing, artist is doing, or, or a Bollywood actor is doing, or your football uh, club is doing. All of this content is just being spread now or posted on social, which just makes life much more simpler to consume it also. So elections is also one such um, activity which is taken social media in a, such a big way. 
some examples that we saw about elections, uh, different political party, different political uh, politicians using the platform and different degrees of usage of these platforms also. degrees as we speak, so six degrees of separation. Uh, this is an idea where if you pick random uh, uh, two people in the world, uh, going between them uh, will take uh, six hops. Right. So, so the idea is pretty simple, but it's been evaluated many, many times and it looks like uh, this is a very, very consistent thing of the connection between two people in the world is uh, is, about, is around six. And of course, uh, social media makes it lesser uh, because the, the closeness of people in the graph itself, in the complete graph of every citizen in the world, every uh, person in the world is uh, also getting smaller and smaller because of the social media as a platform. So that was uh, six degrees of separation. We, we also saw uh, some ideas around it called as strength of weak ties, uh, where the idea is that two people connected, opportunities come generally through weak ties. Information flows between two different networks with the weak ties in between. So these are ideas that have been tested uh, and intuitively also it makes sense and you probably agree to it. Now you have a scientific way of having uh, or, or discussing using these uh, methods in anything that you do. And this is one of my definitely a favorite uh, algorithm or method uh, that I mentioned because strength of weak ties, right? Some of you may have seen it. I also have a um, hashtag that I use called as strength of well wishers. Right? It's, it's very, very critical that many of the opportunities that we get, many of the things that we're able to do, many of the activities that we're able to do, many of the things that we end up getting are generally because of uh, well-wishers who are around us, who are thinking about us or who get that pong about us saying, oh, yeah, 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 I, I need to, uh, I can actually ping uh, PK for this, right? A PK may be a good person to do this. Those kind of thoughts come to people and majority of the times these are weak ties people, people whom we are not very strongly connected. Of course, strong people may get it, but the number of times that the opportunities that come to us is much, much larger as we look at uh, weak ties. Node centrality, different ways of measuring how uh, a graph is, uh, different ways to measure the strengths of a graph, uh, who's more popular in the graph, who's very important in the graph, all of that metrics we saw, degree centrality, between a centrality, closeness centrality. Then we saw some work around how um, sharing location can actually be uh, vulnerable, that is you can actually deduct your home location, your office location, because you're actually sharing some content on social, uh, either geotagged or mentioning about these locations. In this week, we, we kind of had a quick zip through all the ideas, uh, some of the projects um, for you to get a sense of the variety of things that we were going to see in the class. For example, this was Foursquare network, and this was privacy as a problem. This was Twitter as a network, phishing as a problem. This was Facebook as a network, digital footprint as a problem. So I, I was kind of enumerating different networks and different problems, different ideas, different uh, topics that we could actually study in these platforms. Of course, if you, uh, if you want to flip and say that, look, I want to study actually uh, Twitter and uh, digital footprint, of course, that is the space that 
that is how you should actually derive interesting problems, interesting uh, topics to also study. That's was uh, this week, and and uh, thankfully uh, at at uh, week one we started this. Uh, every week we have been having this live session on Saturdays at four thirty, right? Uh, so it's been uh, it was super nice to have. Uh, uh, the first uh, week, also students tune in and uh, ask questions that week. I was not prepared for actually so many questions, uh, but it went long. Questions, discussion, topics, all of that happened in that week. Uh, very, very nice to have uh, some students uh, participate heavily in the course. That was week one. Then we moved on to week two, where it was more of hands-on session. Uh, we did some theoretical ideas about how data can be collected, what are the rate limits, everything. But it was mostly hands-on session about data collecting, analyzing the data, all of that. Different ways of collecting data, uh, searching different databases, APIs and scrapers. Uh, we spent time on what API is, how API works, how data is to be collected from these platforms what all is possible, what all is not possible. Uh, you can look at uh, who posted, what content was posted, who were all tagged in the picture, what is the number of likes, when, what is, when was it posted, retweets, likes, quotes. Those are the content that we can actually get from uh, social media. This is particularly for Twitter. Across the platforms, we should be able to get all of this data. What all is possible, uh, no API key, only search, this is for push shift, uh, no rate limit, there are the data sets that are created in push shift and uh, uploaded. You could actually take the data and do use our, uh, you feel uh, it's useful for you. Big two, um, we, we saw how uh, Tweepy works. Uh, how searching uh, Twitter, uh, streaming Twitter, followers, how do you collect all this data. Then at the end, we also saw the uh, push shift data as part of the Reddit uh, data that is uh, uploaded on push shift. That was week two. Week three, uh, we saw some text as a medium of communication on social media and how you can actually collect this text and use it for some uh, inference making, use it for some useful uh, activity, useful actionable information, how you can actually make use of this data. Where all can we find text? It is on threads, it is on uh, post, it's a reply, reply to reply. Uh, the hierarchy that is available, which is uh, tweet, reply, uh, and then when you reply to this, reply to reply, this is a reply to this. This hierarchy is very helpful to know the way that the conversation is going on also. Uh, quirks of uh, social media text, which is there is um, the the problem with the social media text is also very unstructured. Uh, it is not very formal. Uh, so it's very hard to make sense out of the data and how we can actually use this data with that problem of low, it's a casual speech, right? It's just some text that people are putting it on, on social and to, to the text of very, very high, um, formalism as in the legal document itself. Very different from, say to say, to say Wikipedia, very different from a legal content, uh, legal documents, uh, enforce constraints, 280 characters, 5,000 characters, X number of uh, images that you can upload. All the information is not present in the surface form. Sometimes it's actually very, very hard. Uh, in humor, sarcasm, anecdotes, these are these are like very hard problems on on studying social content. 
products. I'm sure some of you are very excited about knowing these problems and I'm hoping that some of you will take these problems and uh, run with the problem. Cleaning the text is also an important aspect, right? We cannot use directly some text given to us in any analysis. I saw the new John Doe movie and it sucks, uh, wasted uh, $10, bad movies and a, and a smiley or an emoticon. So that is, if this text is given, we need some processing to say, okay, what does this hashtag mean? What does this hashtag refers to? So many use here, can we remove it uh, capitally or can we actually do something with it? All of that. We need these different processing methods to convert the social text into something that is very useful. Lots of text, lots of content, different algorithms that can be used, rule-based methods, machine learning methods, uh, and then you derive some insights out of the post content that you're, you're deriving from the social content. Of course, there are many methods, and this week we looked at many methods by which you can actually process the content and get something very useful. This was one of the examples that we saw, bag of word representation, then we saw some supervised techniques, generally the architecture for doing the analysis or framework for doing the analysis is very consistent, very similar, take some text, uh, train, pre-process the data, uh, then train and evaluate it, uh, then use uh, new text with unknown categories and test it, whether it is actually able to predict, whether it's able to classify, all of that or the content that we saw in week three and this, this methods seem to be very, very repeating in many solutions that are developed. In, in week three, we also saw content that is, again, with respect to hands-on sessions, which was how do you actually read text, how do you actually process the text, can you actually use NLTK, can you use the library to do something. This was the content that we saw as part of week three. So that was week one, two, three, getting some basics out uh, starting to uh, understand the data, starting to process the data, all of that. Then week four, we spent, we understood what fake news is and we started looking at different methods of how the fake news is spreading. Right? What is fake news? How big is the problem? Uh, emergence of fake news on the web. Fake news is multimodal. It's no more text, even though in the week three we saw only text. Uh, it can be multimodal. Week, um, uh, the, the other parts of the content that other parts of methods or algorithms or in multimodal itself, there is image, there's video, those things as as sort of say data source we did not see again for the I mean in 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 fake news we saw how to actually use an image uh, also as an input to find out whether it's fake news but of course we can actually spend um, of course the topic is much much larger in using images or videos as input to any problem solving role of multiple modalities how uh, different modes can actually help the efficiency of identifying fake news. Of course, we also saw in depth of how, what are the different ways that the fake news is created, who's generating it, how this uh, content is getting spread. And uh, this graph is one of my favorite graphs to actually talk about fake news as a problem itself. Um, how fake news spreads much faster much faster, real news comes late, and real news also has lesser virality than the fake news. Web, internet, social, all of that has given a great mechanism, platform for fake news to spread. 
we continued on fake news in week five also we started looking at methods to reduce the impact of uh, fake news i think if you really really look at what is one big takeaway from this fake news part of the course is that we understood different methods we understood different ways by which you can actually identify fake news what type of fake news it is how it is spread all of that but a big solution that we should actually start thinking we should build about we should think about uh, is to find ways to reduce the impact of the uh, fake news that's that's this part of the graph right that is this part of the graph which is that is spreading yes but can we actually find ways to reduce the spread of the fake news uh, reduce the spread of the impact of the fake news also it's a good start to find uh, ways to reduce the spread of fake news but we should also look at uh, impact of fake news so then we delve deeper in fake news about different methods to identify detect all of that uh, various different words are being used for fake news this is a super dense slide on how um, uh, fake news who's creating it what is the different uh, uh, ways and mechanisms for which this fake news is spread a uh, detect propagate validate and generalize can you build systems uh, intervene intervention is the part that i was just now mentioning which is critical uh, can you intervene and reduce the impact of spread reduce the impact of um, outcomes which is actually coming out of these fake news uh, content based context based we can look at solutions which are using different parts of the social data one is just the tweet itself one is the context in which the tweet is coming as a there is a marathon uh, bomb blast that happened that is a context in which we have to actually do the analysis this is boston marathon uh, again um, an architecture that is very consistent across different solutions is this take the content do some pre processing uh, create a method do feature engineering create use the features to create a, a model use the model to predict for a new content build a system around it put it in public get uh, users to use learn from the model learn from the uh, way the which system is building feedback into the model modify the model and move on this is text based word uh, word embedding sentence embeddings document embeddings we saw all of this uh, as part of identifying fake news we saw some research questions also um, in terms of uh, which image which uh, mode is actually helping to identify a uh, fake news better images text the model takes two random patches from different images and predicts whether they are consistent metadata this is using some metadata itself which we saw exif um, and this one uh, is is a method called spot fake which uses multimodal text and uh, images as part of the identifying fake news we also saw some events where the spread of the fake news was very very uh, fast some observations are people who create the content are not the most important or from where it is spreading the most uh, in the graph um, in the large graph and when the event is completed or when there is uh, the the event is subsided in terms of the uh, spread of the fake news right sometimes it's not necessary that some post happens it kind of spikes uh, it may come down quickly and then it can stay somewhere like this and then it can probably drop down go up all of this can happen right generally in social uh, this this part uh, is going to be a few hours 
the the drop is going to start happening very quickly we started delving deeper into different methods uh, data sets that we saw solutions that were built across across uh, tw across twitter facebook uh, whatsapp different methods that are there that was the end of the fake news content that we saw fake news credibility misinformation disinformation all of that and it was super fun at the end of this week or somewhere in this week uh, to actually meet a lot of students who are doing only uh, the bs program uh, this is not only students taking this class uh, i think some are in, uh, taking this class uh, but majority of them are just doing BS as a program itself. Uh, and our interest was to showcase uh, some of the ideas, some of the problems, some of the challenges, some of the projects that we are doing, uh, so students could actually get motivated, interested in part participating in it. I'm super, super happy about seeing many of the students join the uh, paper reading session. If you're listening to it and you're not yet uh, signed up in the Google groups, uh, please look for paper reading sessions. It's called Brainstorm. If you just do for Brainstorm and Precog, you should get. And the mailing list is read with Precog at Google groups. Please sign up and it, it's super fun to see a lot of students join uh, uh, this paper reading session. We are also hoping that we will uh, start looking at uh, opportunities or ways by which we can get you to attend these paper reading sessions in person. Three dimensions of uh, using social media for law enforcement. Now we moved on to week six. How uh, social media can be a good source uh, for uh, a law enforcement. This, uh, this part is very, very relevant to the society also because you will see as we spoke, as last 12 weeks went by, you would have seen, or if you started following some of these uh, accounts, you would have seen how different, how their strategies are changing over a period of time. They are, they are learning as part of uh, doing things on social and up updating, upgrading themselves also. I'm, I'm definitely very excited about seeing uh, social platforms being used for elections, law enforcement, all of these uh, parts of the society are actually making use of it. Actionable information can be derived from social data, uh, which is uh, like the spatial information, like the hotspot analysis. Using that, law enforcement can make use of uh, that information and do something in the real world, in the offline world. Change, go fix a traffic problem, go fix uh, uh, people, people uh, protesting on the street. Fix, uh, give protection, all of that can happen, right? Basically, the law and order activity can be done using, using social media as a source. Law and order can be understood. Pulse of the people can be understood uh, through social. There's also a slide in the deck, right, which talks about why law enforcement should look at social media. Different police organizations use it differently. Here's a slide I was just mentioning, which is why care audience, real-time updates, get closure, investigate, put, put information out there and ask for, ask public to help you. All of that can happen as part of the social, using social. This week we also spent some time on thinking about looking at privacy policy as an idea. What are the components of privacy policy? <clears throat> Why privacy policy is important? What is the role of a privacy policy in using an organization, uh, online website, online services, all that? Different aspect, we also saw BS privacy policy. Uh, then we saw some publicly available information, which could be your cell number, uh, how it can be used to create 
a profile of you, how it can be used uh, to create a system like when, when a call is on your phone and the person, you don't have the person in your contacts, then can you actually understand the number from a social data, whose number it could be, and can you use that to uh, decide whether to pick the call or not, like the true caller. We were able to put together, we discussed about how information can be put together from social platforms to this government websites and uniquely users could be identified when the number is not available in the government data and uh, the government data is not available in Twitter. Identity resolution was a huge chunk of the content that we saw. Important idea of connecting Lori Craner, Lori Faith Craner, and Lori Faith Craner here. This address is Lori Faith Craner, just CMU address here. Uh, Lori Faith Craner has AT&T address here. So this combination of address name, first name, last name, middle name, can we put them together and create, understand that it's actually the same user. That was a problem statement that we spent some time on, different methods to do it, identify a linkability score was created to tell, okay, your accounts are there, we could actually identify you from multiple uh, accounts, this is you. Then we moved on to week seven, almost half, uh, half course was done by then. Uh, and in week seven, we started looking at uh, do we regret about posting on social? Do we go back and delete the post? Do we uh, feel a little ashamed of doing the post? So that was the idea that we saw and we saw different ways by which we can help people avoid the regrettable moments. Ideas, theoretical ideas like bounded rationality, uh, biases, um, context collapse, all of these is background for building these nudges, building these interventions for people uh, to understand and uh, not post things which can have a bad impact, effect on their uh, social platform usage or for sometimes even in real world. Three different uh, uh, nudges were created, uh, picture, time and sentiment and evaluations were done both in lab and in real world, how people actually interact with this uh, nudge. Uh, did the nudge actually change user behavior? Then we started looking at uh, uh, cyberbullying as a topic. Cyberbullying is very hard in terms of studying from social data. Uh, operationalizing it is very hard, uh, extremely subjective, extremely difficult to uh, create ways by which you can actually identify it. Uh, we, we saw what an hate speech is, we saw how YouTube is used heavily uh, to radicalize uh, people and uh, we then delve deeper into looking at uh, how social data can be used for identifying hate speech. Different ways of identifying hate content, uh, again using multimodal methods to uh, categorize uh, the social content. That was week seven. So uh, week seven uh, was uh, looking at cyberbullying, looking at uh, how abusive content can be deducted on social. We Kate, we came back to the basic privacy, started looking at definitions of privacy, how uh, it is necessary to use the ideas of privacy, study the content on social to figure out if there is any information leak uh, from social media. Different types of uh, user behavior, fundamentalist, pragmatist, and unconcerned. Uh, by now, you must be knowing what they are, um, and you must be also looking at people to say whether they are actually fundamentalist, uh, pragmatist, or unconcerned. 
there are multiple studies that we saw. One of the studies did collect data, asking people to fill a survey, get them actually take a picture, uh, identify their social platform uh, by using image uh, picture that they are taken uh, after collecting images from uh, university uh, Facebook page and match them and ask the real user whether this is you. Then there was this auto surveillance, auto privacy leaks that we saw where using social Insta posts, tweets, can you identify who somebody would have voted for? Uh, and can you build again an intervention like the uh, privacy nudge, like the um, picture nudge, sentiment nudge? Can, you, can we build a nudge which can stop people from uh, posting about specifically about elections? Then we, we saw how to collect data from government sources. Uh, can we actually build methods by which you can collect um, voter ID, collect other publicly available uh, government sources to, to create a profile? That was one side, which is to create profiles publicly available. Can you find mechanisms to actually avoid doing this uh, uh, profile creation, which is also in linkability. Can you come up with methods by which your uh, profiles may not be linked? For example, CSProf uh, and uh, let's take P Punguru. Hard to say that these are these two are the same person. That was week eight. Week nine, we spent a whole lot of time on understanding uh, if you were to study some of these topics, ideas, there are many ways to do it, right? One is, of course, collect data, do it uh, uh, yourself and analyze the data um, and create patterns, create uh, inferences from it. That's interesting, of course, uh, but there's, there's some more interesting things can come if you actually start looking at real world users, real world user behavior, interacting with them, understanding why they did what they did, all of it. If not interacting directly, at least through surveys, at least through, because that idea of connecting the offline and online behavior is super, super exciting and critical also for building solutions, for even having a change in behavior of the users. Different, different ways to conduct study, different ways to ask questions, uh, different types of studies, field trial. Um, then we moved on from doing how to collect data, what analysis to do. We moved on to this legal side of privacy where we spent uh, uh, time understanding different laws across the world, different um, ways by which pe these laws look at the word privacy, look at uh, how privacy can be protected. We saw OECD guidelines, we saw FTC principles. Then we moved to India, and then we saw how uh, India current state of privacy uh, in terms of legal uh, framework is. Then GDPR, other countries um, is what we saw. So the legal aspect is an important aspect. I'll go back to uh, talking about just this privacy uh, and security in social media itself is such a diverse topic. It's not only so it's a computer science uh, work or an engineering work. It's it's connecting to law, as I just now mentioned, connecting to users, as, as just we saw. So a lot of other disciplines uh, can actually look at this topic. Of course, the concept of cybersecurity, concept of privacy itself is a uh, concept of uh, security, as in the real world security itself is actually very, very uh, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, all of that. Then we spend some time on how uh, uh, to protect uh, privacy on social media, what things can you do. Then we started looking at this AWOL study, uh, Netflix price, how breaches have happened because data has been made public. And uh, then we saw methods by which you can actually detect the, um, these kind of issues as part of uh, methods like k anonymity, l diversity, T closeness, by which you can anonymize the data and make sure that when you push the data out, make the data public, 
none of the rows can be re-identified to a particular user. K anonymity is an idea, L diversity is an idea, T closeness is an idea, that was week 9. Week 10, we started looking at, look, I think this data is very nice to collect from social, all that, but are there problems in collecting data? Are there problems in terms of ethically, are there problems in collecting data and analyzing it? Just because the user is posting it in public on Twitter, is it okay to actually analyze it and make inferences and make the results again public, saying that, look, the data, I, I can actually infer that A does this, right? A does this is probably a bad idea, right? Because aggregate information is okay. 34% of the people whom we analyze data from this particular city has this behavior is not, nobody is getting re-identified. Whereas if you say A, B, C, Twitter handle which did this, and B, F, Twitter handle which did this in a paper, I think that's going to be tough. Social media data is available, so multiple ways of looking at the analysis. Then we saw you know, looking at the data methods itself, which is interactive and non-interactive, which is you just sit down and collect the data and analyze. As just a few minutes back, I was describing about different ways of conducting studies and collecting data, that those were non-intrusive uh, ways of uh, collecting data and analyzing it one way. And then the interactive ways that you talk to the user, get them to fill a survey, ask them to come to the lab, get them part of the real world study. Then we move to study uh, emotional contagion, looking at how Facebook did a study uh, to, to uh, understand how if I randomly remove some negative post on your timeline uh, newsfeed, what behavioral changes we'll have, similarly for positive uh, removal. Okay, Cupid, data was made public, users were re-identified, um, and again, the arguments were like, look, the data is already public, why should we worry about it? Again, another study to say, uh, uh, analyze the data and say that unidentified uh, university, but it, could, it was easily identified that it was actually uh, Harvard University, uh, then, um, so if th those were the problems. I think if, if you look at all the weak content, we say that, look, here are the challenges, here are the solutions, here are the challenges, here are the uh, solutions, here are the uh, problems, here are the methodologies that you can actually reduce the problem. Uh, institutional Review Board, uh, we talked about uh, in detail about how to send an application, what, what are they looking for, what is the minimal risk, what are the uh, types of users that you should collect data from, all of that. Then this was uh, World Economic Forum's uh, report, which talked about uh, um, scope of considerations needed in data utilization, right? So one is legal compliance, then is privacy considerations, then the societal things, that's where the ethics problem is. In detail, we saw about different ways of actually looking at biases in social data internal validity, construct validity, external validity. I think this this one slide is very, very dense, but this slide has a lot of questions that we need to be aware of, we need to be careful when we do social media data analysis. Biases in social data, we looked at one paper, how uh, using that paper we talked about a lot of these uh, biases. Uh, again, functional bias, data source bias, data collection bias, pre-processing bias, everything, data processing bias, um, and then tampering with sampling itself, sampling of, in this week we saw about how uh, the study had just done some ways by which majority of the tweets that they were sending was actually part of the 1% uh, random sampling tweets that Twitter was giving back. So if these were the problems, right, biases exist, so what do you do, right? Can we actually do something? A list of recommendations were given, uh, describe the limitations of your work, did you discuss any potential risk to the user, did you report the full text of the instructions to the given participant? All of these are just instructions as researchers that we should follow. We should be aware of biases, we should be aware of these ethical problems, the data that we collect from. So week 11, uh, we saw uh, how uh, 
divisive content can be um, analyzed, can be actually classified from the social data. Uh, but the focus of this uh, uh, week 11 and week 12, the part one, was more of getting the deeper part, which in this case was BERT. Uh, research questions that they were asking uh, is to identify, uh, visualize most predictive conversation characteristics across within each de divisive topic. Can you identify a divisive topic? Uh, they used LIWC, that's another thing that we saw new in this lecture. Uh, in this part, which is LIWC as a tool to give input as a text, output as different uh, categories that it actually can uh, classify. We saw what BERT is, we saw what the transformer architecture is, we saw how it, what was the fundamental reason by which it became popular. Uh, and uh, we also gave you a Jupyter notebook, which looked at uh, uh, some basic data uh, processing basic data uh, analysis that you could actually do. Feel free to, meaning I think all of this is uh, linked to the lectures uh, as in the slides itself. Feel free to go take a look at it. If you have any, any questions of any of this, feel free to come back. We'll be happy to actually detail, uh, discuss in detail with you every single thing that we have actually discussed in the class. Uh, popularity shock. Uh, and some people get very popular by doing some things. Uh, of course, hard things, right? He, uh, this user became popular, had a chance to meet with uh, A.R. Rahman. Uh, can we actually study this popularity as a uh, idea? And uh, does this popularity effect continue staying with you? And the users, do they change their behavior or do they do anything different? Uh, or do they continue doing whatever they are doing because they are getting more and more popular. Um, so identifying, uh, so this is another paper which is driving the last mile, characterizing and understanding distractor driving post uh, on social networks. Snapchat was used to identify which part of the world actually has a lot of distractor driving. This is the popularity shock which is can Okay, this is the shock that happened, which is the user became very popular. Uh, can, would it be possible to actually predict that there's going to be a shock here? Would it be possible to predict that, oh, the, after the popularity, the, the interactions of the user actually goes down or will go down? Uh, posting frequency, uh, does that uh, change as part of the user behavior because he's become very popular? This was the part that I said, which is regression discontinuity design, RDD. Uh, these methods is what our focus for injecting this content was, which is week 11 and week 12, part one. Right, week 12 we saw, we took the paper that uh, we looked earlier in the course, which is this Twitter sampling paper, and delve deeper into the paper to see uh, the real methods that they use, how did they use, what was the timestamp, how did they figure out that uh, Twitter was actually um, sampling it at a millisecond level. Those were the content that we covered in week 12, uh, part one. Again, this, this work is a very, very influential work. Uh, so we thought we'll actually uh, talk about it in detail as part of this course. Uh, so that's the end of uh, content that I, I have. Uh, here is a website uh, that I've been updating uh, for the course. Of course, you have access to the YouTube content directly from uh, the course uh, mailing list also. Uh, what I would recommend is if, if you think this is this website uh, or this content was very useful and if you want to talk about it on social uh, please talk about uh, please talk about it on social tag us uh, uh, on the social post that you do uh, link this website so people can actually use this content uh, as and when uh, they need it or whenever it is appropriate for them or if it's appropriate for them at all thanks again for taking the course it was super super exciting for me to teach the course uh, in um, uh, to all of you, I'm I'm hoping that uh, some of you will be able to meet in person at some point in time, and our roads will cross uh, for uh, in future for something or the other. 
good luck with everything thank you for taking the course